Hello, people of the internet. This is Kaiju Noir. And Pete. And we are here to review Jurassic World. It's finally here. It's finally here. After, what was it, like 14 years of waiting ever since Jurassic Park 3. We're back to Is- we're back in Isla Nublar. Uh, <laughs> we no longer have Sam Neill or, you know, we don't have... Uh, any returning. Yeah, we don't have any returning characters. We don't have Jeff Goldblum. We don't have John Hammond, sadly. You know, rest <laughs> his soul. But we are still here with a new cast, a new world, a Jurassic World, in fact. And so, we, it's been a while since the film came out, and already people are loving... Well, it's weird. The movie, like, in terms of reception, it's been split very 50-50. People either really like it or really hate it. And um, But either way, it doesn't matter because the movie made a mad load of money. I, I think you can expect to see... To see a sequel or two, right? Oh, most definitely. I mean, personally, I don't see how they're going to get a sequel out of this. But, you know, uh, life uh, finds a way. <laughs> and I think whether whether and you liked it or you didn't, you know, I mean, people watch this mo- watch you know, the mm-hmm. older movies when they're kids. So it brought everyone back. This right, isn't right. just for kids now or for adults. It brought everyone back. I think that's the reason why it did so well. Right. And if, at the end of the day, you know, it's a movie about dinosaurs and... It seems like people today still love dinosaurs as much as they did back then. I mean, like, sure, we've had a lot of dinosaur movies. Dinosaurs have always been this, these, like, real life, real life monsters that people have always been fascinated by and have always portrayed them, them in pop culture, be it cartoons and movies comics and video games and whatnot and jurassic park was kind of like the culmination of that brought it to a new level it's the icon you know it's like the icon of like all all dinosaur movies this is you know jurassic you know jurassic world jurassic park yeah (laughs) so yeah it does warm my heart knowing that because yeah i mentioned before jurassic park is my favorite movie of all time i reviewed it back in 2013 when it was uh when it came out for its uh in 3d in uh for a limited time for its uh, 20th anniversary you can check that review out if you want to know my uh, thoughts on the film watching it many years later but now we're here with jurassic world it's been uh what was it it takes place in continuity with the last three films which is actually pretty rare nowadays now you You would expect a reboot or a reimagining or any sort of like whatever hit hip cool word that they would try to use to avoid the word reboot or yeah or remake but yeah, it's in continuity. It's been several years. According to this new, uh, con- uh, not c- continuity, according to this film or according to the uh, viral marketing, the new park, Jurassic World, was built on the same island that Jurassic Park was built in, Isla Nublar, in 2005. So the park has been open for about 10 years. Uh, the world at this point has see- apparently been gotten used to the idea of dinosaurs. And so... InGen has and the Jurassic Park uh, Jurassic World scientists have started developing a new hybrid dinosaur. Oh, and it's funny how they call it the first hybrid dinosaur, even though all the dinosaurs have been like hybrids of like toe DNA and all yeah. that sort of stuff. But anyways, it, they combine d- DNA from different animals and dinosaurs to create the Indominus Rex. And of course, as you know, this is Jurassic Park, so you know shit's gonna hit the fan at some point. Basically, it's been years since the first the re- events of the first movie, but. People still never learn. Yes, they still make, they still make mistakes. They, are, I mean, they still make they still make mistakes. Not just mistakes, but the I mean, the same mistakes. You know, playing yeah, yeah. Right. playing God, trying to control nature when nature is something you cannot control. Control is only an illusion. It, it does really carry that theme from the original movie, and that I really and I re- I was really appreciative appreciative of that of that fact. And so the I um the Irex escapes and now he's running about or and oh it's a she I I believe, and so because she what has been kept in captivity all this time she kind of goes a little crazy finding out that she is, she is unstoppable she realizes like these look like strong hands. <laughs> well I when you find out I mean there's a certain element to her that you find out why she is the way she is so she's she's. She's not just a reg- a regular, you know, uh, dinosaur. dinosaur. She's she an intelligent had, yeah, dinosaur. Yeah, and she's had no interaction at all. She's kind of like toying around. She has like, it's kind of like the Irex real, it's, it's kind of like a serial killer 
where once you kill one person you realize and you realize there's no consequences or you feel like there's no consequences to killing people you start going off on a rampage so who better else to stop uh the indominus rex than uh, none other than star lord himself chris <laughs> pratt as owen grady who is a uh, raptor trainer and so he tries to deal with the situation along with uh, bryce dallas howard as uh, Claire, who is the uh, park's operations manager, along with uh, a, an assortment of characters in this film, as they are all trying to uh, contain the chaos in this on this island, or just survive, or just survive, yeah, just like the first part movie. So yeah, this movie is very reminiscent of the first movie, only with a higher body count. Oh yeah, <laughs> and. Um, other than that, there are definitely a lot of callbacks to the first uh, Jurassic Park film, including a very wonderful sequence that I don't want to spoil because, you know, the movie just came out. But there's this sequence in the film where they do pay loving tribute to what came before in previous films. That and there's, uh, again, like I mentioned, different references. They even do that whole, like, rear view window uh, mirror shots. There's this one employee that I really like who is wearing a Jurassic Park uh, oh, yeah. shirt. <laughs> He's like, I got this off eBay, near mint condition. Don't you think that's in poor taste? And I was thinking, well, this park is in poor taste. I know, right? <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, yeah, the same guy, character, the technician. He had uh, Ian Malcolm's book. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was like, uh, what was it called? I forgot what it was, but I can search it up right now. But uh, yeah, well, I, I you know I gotta say, I really enjoyed this film. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I liked it. I, I had a lot of good fun with it, and I mean, that 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 was that was just me. I, yeah, I thought it, it it was a fun watch, and I mean, we'll we'll get into it. Let's get into it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let's see, where should we start? Up, I guess the biggest com- complaint I did have with the movie is. Are the characters themselves? I mean, they're really fun. They were entertaining. I thought they were entertaining for the most part, but I felt like they were underwritten and felt a little bit two dimensional. Where there's not, they don't have a whole lot of depth to them. Uh, yeah, that 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 was a very big thing for me, especially the kids. Oh, yeah, God. yeah, they're definitely my least. No, not they're not my least favorite. We'll get to that later. But they are a bit of a problem with me. I mean, of course, they're again. It's like harkening back to Tim and Lex from the first Jurassic Park movie. But they were actually likable. They felt very like little kids who were just enamored by you know, all this that's going on and you feel you kind of sympathize with them with these two kids i mean we have um let's see who's the kid here uh ty simpkins as gray mitchell who was the ki- actor who played the young kid from iron man 3 a, a while back and uh, he's kind of like this very hyper kid he's like has his infinite seemingly infinite knowledge of uh, dinosaurs i kind of related to him because i feel like i was that kid trying to bother people with like facts about dinosaurs or godzilla and whatnot but um i feel like they really played up that fact to where i'm thinking does this kid have some sort of social disorder or something on um, well here's the thing personally i didn't dislike the kids mm-hmm. i didn't like them either they were just there and yeah. like you're saying, they threw in kind of like a lot of like plot lines with them, their relationship with their family that didn't yeah, really yeah, yeah. It did, it went go nowhere. nowhere. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> so. because they established that the kids, their parents are getting a divorce, and it goes nowhere because it's like, all right, I'm like the parents are like see, meet them at the end of the movie. It's like, oh yay, we're all together well, now. We're still gonna get divorced though. And, and that's just that it goes nowhere and it comes from nowhere. So I, it's like, hey, hey why are you crying? Our parents are separating. <laughs> so, hey, man, we're always going to stay together, man. So, I mean, I can, I can get with a, a kid having, you know, like, anxiety or, yeah, like, yeah. being, you know, a little, you know, different. Yeah. But it just doesn't work out too well for this movie. Yeah, definitely. I mean, oh, let me just get into the other kid before I get into the divorce aspect. Uh, what was, let's see, who was the other kid? Uh, mm-hmm. Nick Robinson as uh, Zach Mitchell, uh, who plays uh, Gray's brother, who is the brother of Gray. I really did not like him at all. I mean, he seems like the very kind of teenager that oh, I wanted. <laughs> I wanted no part of. I don't care. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm too cool for school, man. <laughs> what are we doing? Dinosaurs are like totally passe, man. <laughs> let me just uh, let me just stare at this young hot chick like a stalker, man. Oh God, I know, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. I have a girl. <laughs> did I have a girlfriend at the beginning of the movie? Yeah, she's like totally annoying. But yeah, it's like a very one-dimensional typical annoying teenager that you i want to see him get eaten honestly <laughs> i mean i figured <laughs> i feel like you know what that would have been a lot better instead of the divorce aspect have one of the brothers die that way that in that it, that um 
influences the other brother to become a stronger person, realizing they have, need to rely on themselves. Or if the younger brother was eaten, then the younger brother would learn to have emotions and actually care for stuff. It's exactly, yeah. But I like the idea of two brothers that they don't really have a lot of common, but they come together in the end. They try to do that in this movie, but I feel like it didn't really work because of that divorce subplot. Well, not just that, but the thing that brought them together was just survival. Survival. It wasn't them actually working together. It was just they they lived. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure after this event, will they be, you know, I don't know. (laughs) And of course, like the divorce sub, like um, we've mentioned before, it has no impact on the plot at at all. And I feel like it's a very forced habit, a a forced uh, plot thread just to say, hey, man, we're always going to stick together, you and me. I feel like you still, like I mentioned before, you still could have had that subplot without the divorce aspect. Yeah. So I guess, let's see, moving on. Let's talk about uh, Chris Pratt himself, you know, as the uh, Raptor trainer, uh, Owen Grady. I feel like with him, he seems to be a combination of uh, Grant and Malcolm from the from the first Jurassic Park. He's kind of like the like the the resident dinosaur expert, but at the same time, he's kind of like the guy like Ian Malcolm who says, "Hey, man, uh, this system doesn't work. It's gonna break down eventually." And I really liked him. I felt I thought he was a really cool. He was a, a really cool badass. I mean, I loved his relationship with the uh, the Raptors. Mm-hmm. And while he character does not really get all that much development of outside of his growing relationship with the Raptors, uh, I feel like his character really didn't need to have a sort. I, I feel like I was okay with him being a static character because it seemed like everyone else. It seemed like everyone else was going was learning from him, right? And to become stronger he, like him. His character arc is done, and he I mean, ba- it, yeah, he yeah. Does, he doesn't need to grow. I mean, in this case, we don't really need him to grow. He is who he is, and we're yeah, happy yeah. with his character. I guess he's sort of like a mentor figure in a way, kind of. I don't know. I, he's a change that people and people like. He's a change that people need, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah so in in that aspect, and, and they learn. People learn from him. Yeah. So I mean, he 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 serves a purpose really. Oh yeah, most definitely. And uh, what I really liked about that aspect, when the trailer for the first trailer to Jurassic World came out, a lot of people were very hesitant about the idea of trained Velociraptors, and they, people thought that was silly. I was on board with that from the start, and I thought that idea with them what was it like Charlie, Delta, Blue, and a fourth Raptor whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. They, I love the idea of training raptors because it enforces the idea that these are not movie monsters, but rather animals. Right. And that's a private, I, I know I'm quoting from my friend Zazibar here from his Jurassic Park reviews that one of the biggest issues I have, like Zazibar with the Jurassic Park movies, is that they don't treat the dinosaurs like animals like they did in the first movie, but rather like, you know, movie monsters. They're all like, I'm going to eat everything. <laughs> Rawr. But here, the, they treat them like animals in that, you know, you can train them, but you can never, you, while the, you can make them obedient to an extent, you can never fully domesticate yes, them. Yes, yes, exactly. Like, as as much training as, as uh, what's his name, well, as Chris Scratch's character had yeah. with them, I mean, there was still that worry that they weren't going to listen, that they were yeah. going to attack. So, I mean, mm-hmm. like you said, you can train them, but yeah. you can never be fully sure they're going to, you know, do what you say. Yeah, and I love that line. It's not about control. It's about trust. And, uh, yeah, it kind of reminds me of, like, Siegfried and Roy, how they would train tigers, and even eventually they got attacked by their own tigers. <laughs> Actually, it's pretty dark. Let's not laugh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Although, uh, it kind of reminds, sorry to get off track, but it reminds me of this, uh, one comedy bit from, uh, what's his name, Chris Rock, where people was like, oh, the tiger went crazy. I was like, the tiger didn't go crazy, the tiger went tiger! <laughs> <laughs> what did you expect? You play with a fucking tiger! <laughs> I'll tell you when the tiger's crazy, when you have force that tiger to ride a unicycle going, oh, I'm a crazy tiger, I'm a crazy tiger. <laughs> but anyways, uh, let's see, moving on to, let's say, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard as uh, Claire. Snore! <laughs> yeah, you really, huh? God. I'd, I mean, she wasn't necessarily, like, the worst, but her character wasn't interesting for me. She had a weird relationship with uh, her nephews. Uh-huh. Uh, she, I mean, obviously, she's a workaholic. And I don't, I, I don't know. She, she kind, of sort of, kind of like, sort of like that cliche thing where it's like, oh, you spend too, you spend too much time at work. You need to settle down and have a family. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a typical sort of of uh, story arc you, or character arc you've seen before, where the the woman is too busy, or not the one, but the 
person in question, the character in question is too busy with work, not enough time for their family, needs to find an equilibrium, find like a, a balance between both worlds. Okay, I guess so. I was really afraid that they were going to go in a direction that would have, I guess, I would have seen as like, uh, personally, I would have seen as kind of sexist, where it's like, where her where she calls the brother her nephew's mother her sister and she's like oh you need to settle down you need to have kids and it's like excuse me she's a successful businesswoman you want her to give up that sort of lifestyle just to <laughs> make her life worse with kids not to mention she's pretty athletic i mean she was running with heels throughout the whole movie oh yeah that was another thing that really <laughs> bugged me in the movie because like I didn't realize she had heels. Me neither. I just saw like, that online minute. later on. Was she running away from dinosaurs <laughs> and everything on fucking heels? Like, what kind of bullshit is that? And then I learned that um, the actress, um, Dallas Howard herself, she convinced the director to keep on the heels because she thought that it would preserve her character's femininity and she thought that it would be realistic for her, for her type of character to wear such high heels. No. <laughs> and you know what they did? They hired a UFC champion to train her to walk and, you know, perform in high heels. Are you kidding me? So, so, you know, I guess in terms of, you know, production-wise, they really didn't spare no, they really did spare no expense. That, I, I guess dedication, but. But really, it was like, you gotta think to yourself, Bryce, if it requires, if run, if, if performing in high heels requires hiring a UFC champion, <laughs> I don't think running in high heels would be realistic to begin with if you need to go that far. I know. Oh, God. As for her, it being related to her character, I guess you can make the stretch that her, her character is in control mentally and physically when it comes to her position as a woman with tons of responsibilities in terms of running the entire park. Uh, bi the business side of the park so i guess she's kind of trained herself to be able to uh have total control over herself and in such case perf running on high heels i guess you can say that it's kind of a stretch though in terms of preserving her femininity i don't know i think that kind of i don't know it, it seems a bit pointless yeah I and mean, it's, it's not damaging it's not rewarding it's just pointless really yeah and you know it's just very distracting because again, I've I have you know, I've seen my mother and my sister walk around or you know go out in high heels. I've seen how uncomfortable those are. <laughs> if you try running in high heels, even if she doesn't, her character doesn't seem like a very athletic person. But seeing her do all that stuff, her ankles would just snap in a well, second. To be fair, I think the majority of people didn't even realize she was yeah, in heels until like the ter the the pterodactyl scene where you see a full body shot of her when she's shooting a, a dimorphodon, I think it was called, or rampharinkus. I'm not so sure. So it's not too distracting. It's a little bothering after the fact when you yeah, yeah. actually think about it. But I mean, throughout the movie, it's not like they're right in your face, you know, just kicking you. Yeah, it's not. It's not kind of like a an action movie starring Angelina Jolie, where like her character is running around in high heel or high heels and acting all sexy, making sexy poses as she's kicking ass. Yeah, I nothing mean, like that. <laughs> so, I, and besides, I, if we're talking about wardrobe. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's kind of like on the lower, lower end of importance of a, of a movie. That's true. Um, I apologize, uh, audience, to, for talking about it for this long, but you know, everyone else has at this point. So I don't know. I just want to get off my chest. But her character, I guess, he, I don't know. I'm very half and half on her character. I didn't complete. I wasn't completely disinterested. I had some sympathy for her in terms of being this character who has a lot on her plate, and then having you know these children in her life. I do like the idea. I thought they, even though it's cliche, I do like how they executed the idea of a woman trying, or a, care, a person trying to balance, you know, two different aspects of her life and getting closer to her family as a whole. Although, um, I think her romance with uh, Owen Grady kind of came out of nowhere. Yes, it did. Although, I'm, I'm not sure if it was intentionally comedic. It, like, it was funny because it came out of nowhere. I mean, they, they imply that they've had a uh, date. A, a date. And but nothing like, comes from it. Nothing comes from it. And then it comes back out of comes back out of nowhere. What? I don't know. I... Yeah. And I don't know, did it seem like uh, uh, some people have talked about this. Some people thought that the dialogue between Owen Grady and um Claire sam seemed kind of sexist, where it's like it's the woman who's very uptight and bitchy, while the guy is very lo he's very like relaxing and can wants to think about, like, sex and stuff or whatever. It's like... I mean, you, you could say, arguably, on the lines of, like... I mean, they portray a woman that's so focused on her work that she can't have a family. They don't allow for, like, you know... They don't... 
I don't know if it pictures like a woman that can do both family and job. Mm-hmm. So if you want to make an argument there, like it's it's either one or the other. That is very true because I remember in one of my last classes I took in college, uh, one of the things we talked about in terms of the portrayal of women in media that's been a current thing that's been going on for decades is like the working woman. And like you mentioned before, there's never been, there's rarely has there been a woman who is successful at both her professional and um, domestic lives. It's either one or the other. And they, they tend to criticize women or try to, whenever there's a woman in power or a woman in a professional uh, business, that person tends to suffer as opposed to it, her, any woman that's in a domestic setting. So yeah, it does seem kind of sexist to, to have a woman in a prof- in, uh, in a, uh, sorry, occupational setting. It's only to have her, you know, kind of fall apart in the end. But I don't think that really happens here, where, sure, everything falls apart and she is criticized for her position. She does end up coming out as a stronger individual. So, I I don't know, I guess it's very half and half. Because, again, these are we're dealing with themes that have been going on in Hollywood for decades exactly. now. This isn't the first movie that, you know, that... Gives you like a, a polarizing effect of either a woman that has a family or the woman that is a workaholic and can't seem to find a perfect balance of both. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is nothing new. Right. It's to say that this movie is sexist because of that, uh, because of the character they give uh-huh. her, would be a little un, un you know, un, unfair. It's, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, although it's kind of weird, it's like it seems like at the end of the movie, Jurassic Park, Jurassic World is like no more. Sorry, spoilers, but I guess mild <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> She's much more closer to her family now. So are they kind of saying that she's abandoned her professional life and gone towards a family life? I'm not sure about that because it seemed like the more she doesn't it didn't look like she wanted to start a family of her own, but even though she's with uh with oh she's with Owen by the end of the movie. But I like that line where it says like what are we going to do now? We survive together. So it's like we're going to need each other. I need you to help. I need you to survive as much as you need me. So it looks like you know they're together. But does that imply that they're going to have a family, you know, and again, have a more domestic life as opposed to a professional life? I don't know. It's, it's, I guess you can interpret either way. I'm, it's kind of a scary thought to think that she's going to abandon her, her, you know, her work life to go have a family. But, or you can see it as, you know, she's going to have, you know, find that balance. balance. I feel like that would be good. Or, I don't know, it's very, again, it's all over the place. So there is that issue, but I guess it doesn't really affect you as you're watching the film, per se. I guess it's just like one of those things you think about after watching the movie. So <laughs> so let's see. I guess um, uh, two more characters I wanted to talk about. One was uh, Vincent D'Onofrio as uh, what's it, Vic Hoskins, who is the head of security operations for InGen. And there's this whole subplot about him wanting to get the Raptors or get this like whole training raptors thing and apply it and sell it to like military divisions to make them like raptor mercenaries and can we just have a big red name ta- <laughs> red red flashing thing that says eat me eat me yes. eat me like I, he was, he was <laughs> my least favorite character in the that movie. too yeah i mean everyone else was kind of like two-dimensional and cartoonish and stuff he was just like over the over like over the top, like mustache twirling, like lips licking, like mm, yes, I can't wait to get these raptors to work for me. I know it's like come on, I, I don't know. Like you just see him smiling. He is he's like watching over the screen. He's like yes. <laughs> he's like you know rubbing his hands together. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, it's, it's very yeah. Yeah, there's this guy. He's this very you. You're just waiting for him to get eaten at this point because they. The foreshadowing is like so obvious. obvious. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, although it's very, it's a very interesting idea, fact, not fact, but it's an, it's an interesting observation I made where he's one of those guys who can't comprehend the idea that dinosaurs that are female. He constantly there's kind of a, a tiny bit of a running gag where he refers to the raptors as male, even though it's like, what's his name? His um, her name is Blue, and she's a girl. So I guess he's kind of like a sexist, you know, mach- super macho military man. I'm the bad guy because, you know, apparently in, in film, all military related dudes are bad, bad guys. <laughs> and so it's kind of like a criticism towards that, like, super macho uh, mentality. But in the end, you know, the characters really, really amount to nothing. The whole Raptor subplot, again, 
interesting, I guess, because InGen wants to branch out beyond, or I guess like part of, there's a part of InGen that wants to branch out beyond amusement parks Military. and merchandise and wants to, yeah, up, start applying their dinosaurs and their millions of dollars into investing their millions of dollars into something, Which, some other thing else. It's just like the plot for any like high tech advanced thing. I guess, yeah, It's definitely, like, yeah. oh, this can benefit mankind. Let's make it for the army. <laughs> it's like, we uh, want to weaponize it. Yeah, exactly. Where's General Ross here to just convince us? And uh, it doesn't, really, again, it doesn't really amount to nothing. Like, oh, we have these, like, army dudes, not army dudes, but we have these security dudes with guns and shit, and they get wiped out by the IREX, like, in about a couple of seconds. It was like, oh, we're going to finally use the Raptors against the IREX. Oh, they don't work at all. <laughs> and again, how do you expect... He says, like, oh, we're going to have Raptors, and we're going to have them... Uh, we're going to apply them. We're going to send them to, you know, instead of human soldiers, we're going to have Raptor soldiers. Again, how is that going to work? How do you think Raptors are going to succeed against guns and bombs and shit? I mean, miraculously, they do go up successfully go up against the humans... <laughs> I don't know how that works, but okay. I, I just thought it was a really silly idea. And what's interesting to note is that Jurassic Park 4 has been in development hell for many, many years. As you mentioned, 14 years, per, um, to be specific. And one of the leak, one of, one, a while ago, this was like years ago, probably in 2008 or 2009, there was a leaked script that discussed, uh, that had like a, le a leaked script for a possible it was a leaked script, rejected script for a possible Jurassic Park 4. And in that script, what we got was uh, dinosaur human hy human dinosaur hybrids oh. that would have acted as mercenaries. Oh, no. <laughs> and they were to be led by the main character. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to learn about, if you want to know more about that script, check out uh, one, one of the latest episodes of Zazubar's web podcast, The Demons from Outer Space. And it seems like, oddly enough, a lot of those, some of those concepts were brought into this movie. The whole, let's have dinosaurs as mercenaries, let's make a hybrid dinosaur. Thankfully, not a human dinosaur <laughs> hybrid. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's, so it's very interesting to see those come into this sort of thing. Uh, oh yeah, I, did you, uh, do you have any further thoughts on, on, um, Vic, Vic Hoskins? Uh, not really. I mean, you basically. I mean, there's not much to say about him yeah. other than he's a very a simple guy. character who plays a bad guy that makes things go even more out of control. Yeah. So the last character I really wanted to talk about was BD, BD Wong returning from the first movie as Doctor Henry Wu, who's the chief geneticist and the head of the team that created the dinosaurs for Jurassic World, and he was the guy that invented the like the gene splicing technology that was able to bring dinosaurs to life in the first place. I really liked this character, and I feel like he was kind of like the most fleshed out of all the characters in this movie, despite him being only like a very supporting cast. And uh, what's funny enough, he was a very... He wasn't a very... he Even though he's the guy that was responsible for the dinosaurs, dinosaurs creation in the first place, he was kind of... He didn't really have that... He didn't have a, a big part at all in the first movie. He was just, hey, I'm the dude who made this technology... <laughs> See ya. You think he'd make him millions of dollars and he'd be well known, well regarded? And yeah, but here he had a much larger. The thing is, I recently read the uh, Jurassic, the first Jurassic Park book by Michael Crichton, and um, Doctor Wu in the book had a much larger role. He was kind of a bit arrogant. He was very uh, antagonistic towards people who criticized his uh, his genetic splicing or his system. He was kind of like that character who was like, "This is me. I'm the real father behind. I'm like." I'm I'm the real person behind. I'm like the I'm the real create the true creator of Jurassic Park. F I, Hammond. I yeah, am. fuck Hammond. <laughs> I'm if you know Hammond wouldn't be shit if it wasn't for me. And he's kind of like that character. They this this uh, in Jurassic World they made Doctor Wu more like his um his portrayal in the original book. And we and I really love that conversation between him and uh, Masran Masrani, who I forgot to mention he's like the new person in charge of InGen. And Jurassic World, who was very interesting, very likable character, very reminiscent of John Hammond in terms of his philosophy, his like philosophy on like the dinosaurs and making you know, he, it's not about the money, it's about like you know bringing the, the dinosaurs to life and showing them to the world. I just thought that he didn't get a lot enough development because I thought it kind of wasted him by the by the middle of the movie. Not to spoil much, yeah, but yeah, to in that conversation between Masrani and Doctor Wu. 
uh, Doctor, he's Masrani is uh, criticizing Doctor Wu. He's like, "Hey, why do you have all these? Like, why is the Irex have like camouflage and is able to hide his th- his um, body temperature, or whatever it's called?" And um, Doctor Wu is like, "Hey, you wanted a big, scary monster. You wanted a predatory type monster. I gave you. <laughs> I gave you it. You wanted big and scary. I gave you big and scary. You can't expect to have a predatory dinosaur and not have the things that make him a predatory dinosaur." And it's like. I love that idea that he mentioned where it's like, hey, you know, with gene splicing is something that we've been doing since the very beginning. We've always been including random animals into our code to fill in the blanks of the DNA code. We've had to. We've had to. Trust me, if these dinosaurs, you, this is, you wanted, you did not want it nature. You wanted a fantasy. If these dinosaurs look like, real, look like how they did in real life, they look nothing like what we have in real life, what we have here in the park. And it's funny because it parallels real life, too. Definitely, yeah. And that totally explains and now it legitimizes why there are no feathered dinosaurs or why the, the Spinosaurus is not a four-legged swamp creature or why... Um, why the, the Velociraptors, again, not having feathers, but and why they're huge, it makes so much sense now. Kind of like, they, it's a interesting way of legitimizing the scientifically inaccurate dinosaurs that in this in this in these movies and while it does kind of take away from the fact that in the original movie they were trying to say oh these are real dinosaurs this is how they really look like 65 million years ago it kind of takes away that magic that these are supposed to be like how they look like but considering how far paleontology has come since 1993 it's very interesting to finally have like a legit explanation or for them to acknowledge that, yeah, these dinosaurs are not realistic looking. And yeah, again, it kind of it plays into that idea that was also presented presented in the book where um, Dr. Wu approached him and saying, hey, let's make these dinosaurs more slow moving. Let's make them uh, less vicious. Let's make them more lumbering. I mean, let's make them more like how the people's perceptions of dinosaurs are as opposed to reality. And again, it parallels that line that he says in this film: "You didn't want it uh, real. You didn't want it real life. You wanted a fantasy." Again, playing to the whole "let's pander to the to let's pander to the biggest demographic. Let's you know give them what they think a dinosaur should look like." And I thought that was very interesting uh, world building in terms of the park and how it operated. Sorry for going on that long time. No, it's good. I, sure. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, like I said, it, it makes it just a little bit more interesting. It grounds it in reality just a little, just a tiny bit more. You know, mm-hmm. it, it you actually you're bringing at kind of like actual science into it, and it helps us understand why things are the way they are. Yeah, and it kind of really ties into the theme of this movie, where the movie, oddly enough, not only acts as a commentary on how corporations tend to rely on investors and like what do you call them um study group like what do you call it? test audiences or um or like you know invest um uh, businesses it's like you know it kind of relies on how we're gonna we're trying we're like all these corporations trying to um base their decisions off of off of what they think audiences want and what their investors want in order to create what they ho- hopefully what they believe to be a, a successful product and not only does that does the movie focuses on that, the movie also kind of reflects on the Jurassic Park franchise as a whole because this movie itself was made by investors and by <laughs> you know st- uh, study groups and by you know test audiences and all sorts of stuff to produce to become a pro- a, whole, a successful product. So it's kind of, yeah, it's very funny how focus group focus really groups. Group. Yeah. Sorry, I'm very sorry, I forgot that. Yeah, focus groups, investors, you know, uh, marketing all these sorts of things that define that have defined this film's plot as well as the Jurassic Park franchise as a, as a whole. So in, in other words, the movie itself has become self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I really liked about this film and what I think makes up for the lack of character death and um, in, in-universe backstory and what gives it an edge over the likes of, say, uh, Jurassic Park 3. Now, uh, Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Where well, another bit of uh, I mentioned, like the lack of in in universe backstory, even though this is clearly in continuity with the first three films, they don't bother to explain how on earth this park was able to be to have been built, despite the fact that Jurassic Parks two and three happened. Well, the only thing I can think of is they paid people 
Mm-hmm. And money makes the world go around. Money makes everything okay. It's not in the United yeah. States, so I mean, it's I not mean, like, like it... in 1997, a T-Rex attacked our hometown. Just wondering, would you be willing to go to Jurassic World despite the fact that in 2005, it, despite the fact that eight years late per- previously, a T-Rex Fuck attacked no. your town? <laughs> Fuck no! I'd, I'd be I'd, I'd be fighting as much as I could to get that place shut down. <laughs> Litigation all over the place. Fucking. I'd, no, no, God, I, I don't want to like arrest and just like shut it down. Da- shut it down. <laughs> what about you? I don't know. I mean, like, uh, yeah, you know, realistically, yeah, I was like, hey, I just saw a T Rex destroy my local McDonald's. Okay, they so, killed uh, Boomer. They killed Boomer. <laughs> So yeah, I, I personally it was like, you know what? I just witnessed, you know, uh, exact the reason why I do not want to go to Jurassic World. But then again, you know, maybe people outside of San Diego who are like, hey, dinosaurs are awesome. Let's go there. <laughs> people always want to see dinosaurs, I guess. So who knows? I don't know. I wish they would have gone into that, but they kind of brushed it under the rug, and you know, they tried to no uh, social political uh, yeah, n- talks. none of that sort of you know. They didn't want. I guess they didn't want to go too in depth with the whole business angle. Because well, I, mean, well, a lot of times, socio political stuff can get pretty boring, especially for some audiences. Mm-hmm. So, although it was that kind of took up the majority of the Jurassic Park novel, and in my opinion, that's what made the the book very interesting, and like what in, yeah, what it lacked in like uh, a, a lot of the book itself was mostly exposition and scientific talk. <laughs> <laughs> science talk science talk and exposition and the exposition about how this world worked and how it was almost impossible to yeah it, it was impossible to control uh this type of environment on an island but uh again all this stuff just is like ignored in the book i mean i'm not ignoring the book ignored in jurassic world they don't talk about how they're able to tr- how they're able to raise and feed and take care of um, dinosaurs that they know nothing about, animals that they know nothing about and have been extinct for millions of years. Again, they don't cover that. You're just like, hey, dinosaurs, <laughs> it's been 10 years, so all that shit has already been covered. So I guess it's kind of a lazy for the writers to not bother explaining it, but rather, you know, kind of ignore that big glaring aspect. Makes their job a little easier. I guess so. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's been ten years. We've already. We, you don't need to know about that stuff. Honestly, I would love to see some of that stuff come out. And yeah, see yeah. How, and see I, how they were able to perfect this system that supposedly has been working for ten for a decade. I, I guess the easiest way to put this is you're reintroducing a franchise that's pretty old. You don't want to alienate your viewers by putting in some things that are kind of polarizing towards some uh, some audience members. So mm-hmm. some people will enjoy that. But not everyone will. Mm-hmm. So let's cut that out and give them what they want. I guess so, yeah. And again, that th- what you just said right there, giving the audience what they want, kind of go, kind of like works with the whole theme of what the franchise and what the, you know, the whole theme of corporations giving the audience what they want. It's kind of, uh, what do you call it? It plays into that theme that the movie's kind of based around. So I guess you're right in that, in that part. Now, the last thing I want to say. That ending, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, that ending. <laughs> I remember I was like, when I, when we were, we watched the uh, the opening night. We were like the opening night, midnight screening, and it, which was jam, jam packed, by the way. Yes. And I was like, I was telling you, like, oh, my God. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, we had a good time. Yeah, we all. I, I, Michelle was was like she was having a good time too. We all, we, I, I obviously you were you were, yeah. you were the most excited one. But <laughs> like, I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like yeah. there was times I'm like oh oh oh, I'm like <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. I'm sorry for just fangasming all about, but it's like that's my reaction actually, to that, that ending. That's that's one thing I want I want to talk about. Yeah, the action. I mean, we talked about the story. We talked about the characters. Yeah, but the action, especially the the, yeah. the last the last <laughs> moments. <laughs> pretty much like one big action movie it's kind of like you know fuck the nuance from in like the 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 ambiance of like the first movie no let's just go straight into the whole aspect and for you know that that for what it for what it set out to do and in, in that it's a big over-the-top fun action movie with dinosaurs it succeeds at doing that small characters big monsters let's do it <laughs> indeed 
uh, what was that? there was this one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, the special effects. Now all the dinosaurs are predominantly CGI, and that did bother me. And it's kind of like a, a big reflection of what action movies have kind of devolved into, or kind of grown into in the last decade or two. Where before the um, Jurassic Parks, they would um, the older Jurassic Parks move Jurassic Park movies. They would rely uh, on the animatronics as much as they ca- could, especially on close-up shots. And now, and only use CGI when only when it was impossible to use um, animatronics in the fla- in the first place. And what we have here is the exact opposite, where it's all CGI. And um, I would say uh, the CGI, it's definitely, uh, it's not mind blowing per se, but it does it, it does its job. I mean, obviously, it's not as groundbreaking as the the first movie was in terms of the the effects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's up to par with the, the current effects we see today. Mm-hmm. I think to see we we will, it's gonna be a long time before we see a big jump in effects again. Yeah, I mean, because I guess we're gonna have to wait for like Avatar two or something from James Cameron's crowd. Yeah. But then again, would anyone really give a shit about Avatars until then? I I don't know, but even then, I. The jumps aren't as big as they used to be. Mm-hmm. Kind of like what happened between like the jump from PS, the PS3 and Xbox 360 to Xbox One and PS4. Yeah. And because I mean, we've already got it to like almost so realistic, it's like, mm-hmm. and we can jump by ten or twenty percent, but it's not mm-hmm. that all amazing to the to the human eye. Yeah. So also, what's very inter- what's kind of odd is how audiences now kind of. I had the feeling that audiences react more negatively towards animatronics. Because if they've seen something that is real, they'll think it's fake because they're so used to seeing CG. It's like that's not CG, therefore it's fake. It's almost like which a is gr- weird. It, it's, it's almost like a groan. It's like ah, come on, you're using that. Like you know, that's 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 <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> like like you know, it's like you tr- imagine if you try to show a little kid today uh, Jurassic Park one, and you see like the big old T Rex looming next to the to the uh, the uh, the tour car. And they're like, "What? That looks fake." Yeah. To which you respond with, "Defect." <laughs> and you know, it's actually it, what you just said. Kind of like it hit me. Like, You're right. You know, what's what's fake is real, but what's real, what looks real is fake. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's a weird mentality. I'm not sure how common this is. I have a feeling that it might be, but who knows? But I guess that's kind of the thing where they do use animatronics. Like uh, remember the dying Apatosaurus? How they were with it? Mm-hmm. They were during his dying moments, and it looked very beautiful. Um, and sadly, that's like one of the few times they actually use animatronics. The other time was when they used the raptor heads. Um, they were they were in that and they're sitting there like little lock lock. Yeah, yeah. Things. All you see is our heads, and I'm not sure if it was. I've seen the animatronic. I've seen pictures of the animatronics, but I couldn't tell where if they were CG or if they were animatronics because during the whole time they looked like they were covered in CG. Honestly, they could have been both. They could have been both, right? But. I I, just, I don't know. It's like it looked too fake. Where it's like I can tell that this was enhanced <laughs> by CG at least. And I was like, why couldn't you just use animatronic heads the whole time? Again, they're fucking heads. And again, that might just be pandering to the audience that we have today. That's very um, true, um, yeah. Unfortunately, that's just the that's just what we see yeah. today. That's what people want. Feed them what they want. Right. And they did say that. Um, I have heard. I've seen the animatronic for the Irex. But apparently, they did a lot of the scenes that they shot with the IRX animatronic. Mo- majority of it was cut out of the film. Oh wow! Yeah, so I have have a feeling that, and for what I understand, they got the people be- who made those animatronics were people who worked with Stan Winston on the original Jur- original Jurassic Park. They're kind of like legacy special effects artists. So I have a feeling that maybe the only reason why they made animatronics in the first place was to pander to those dra- hardcore Jurassic Park fans like myself. <laughs> Actually, you at, might have a point. We which, might be looking at it from the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, at which point, I'm thinking to myself, if you're if you're bringing animatronics specifically to cater towards the fans, I feel like that should not be the mentality going into a movie, where it's like, you'd think that they would go with animatronics as much as they could to make a movie more realistic, but but no, they'd like let's just rely on CGI and then uh, let's let's throw them a bone and give them animatronics. I feel like they're going about they were going about it the whole, the wrong way. I mean, again, no disrespect to the animatronics, not disrespect to the CGI artists. I guess more to like the people in charge of 
I guess the special effects are like the special effects director as a whole for how they try to approach that movie. But again, this is simply a reflection of the modern times and how big budget move special effects driven movies are run today. And also they're cheaper too. Uh, uh, CG oh yeah, yeah. CGI is a lot more expensive, I think, than animatronics. But animatronics take more time to develop. So yeah. <laughs> um. So is there anything else that we have not covered yet? I feel like there may be, uh, and I might be kicking myself when I'm editing this. <laughs> <laughs> editing this, I'm like, damn it, I should have mentioned that. But I think I've said everything I want to say uh, about this film. I I I'm, I can't. I'm tapped out on on things to say. Other, yeah. All right then. So, final thoughts. Final Pete. thoughts. I would definitely watch it in theaters. Did we watch it in 3D by accident? We saw it in 3D by accident only because that was the only one available. Okay, to- I wasn't sure. I wouldn't say you have to watch it in 3D. I don't think this movie necessarily merits a 3D uh, bump up. Uh-huh. But it was definitely a good movie, and for those who haven't seen it, I'd recommend go watching it. I don't know if I'd own it, but then again, I'm not the biggest Jurassic Park fan. Uh-huh. Um, it was definitely a good time. Definitely fun uh, fun to watch. So, I mean, for me, I'd, I'd give it a 3 out of 5. Okay. I didn't remember what I wanted to say, luckily. Uh (laughs) It was the score. They brought back the original John Williams theme. I was so happy they brought it back. However, they really felt like they really misused it. (laughs) Where when you you would expect to hear that, it's like... um, Where you started hearing that... And like... Da 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 like yeah, like the, you see the little kid on his fr- on, on his face is like really ex- he's really excited he's <laughs> rushing to his hotel room trying to you know get a good look at the park and like yeah I was like ex- excited with him that's like, me that's me that's I'm me. right there <laughs> I, like you hear the music like here we go here we go <laughs> da 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 like oh it's it there's it's just the buildings oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess that's how it's gonna be. And then the next time they did like the classic part, da 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 da, da. and it was during it was during a uh, Masrani's uh, helicopter ride. Again, no dinosaurs. I, although, again, you could argue that in the original Jurassic Park, they did use that theme song for the for a helico- similar helicopter ride with Hammond and the cast. With no dinosaurs, so I guess that was kind of a call, more of a callback to that. But again, it's like it's weird they don't actually use the uh, missed timing. Yeah, I guess the only time where the Jurassic Park uh, theme was used correctly was when they kind of revisit the old, the original, oh, the yeah. ruins of the original. Uh, what is it called? The visitor, the visitor center. That was awesome. Yeah, it's like the very soft, and very. Um, mellow and very uh, nostalgic feeling of. Uh, Nostalgia-inducing uh, piano piece. Yes, that that worked. So yeah, that was my one little nitpick about the film. So my final thoughts on Jurassic World. This I can't. I to quote my friend um, and Shoma, uh, like him. I came in expecting a big fun action movie with a uh, big fun action movie with dinosaurs, and that's exactly what I got. Uh, all I can say is this movie, despite its problems, this movie overall was fun. It was a hell of a lot of fun. I went. I've seen it twice already. I definitely would own. Uh, recommend buying it if you're a Jurassic Park fan. I feel like a no-brainer. <laughs> a no-brainer. Definitely go out and watch it if you haven't watched it already. If you're not one of the millions of people who gave over f- a billion dollars to this movie already, do you think it deserves a bump up to 3D? I would say so. Yeah, this movie. I would say does. Uh, re- I would recommend checking it out in 3D. I've seen it twice in 3D. Ironic, funny enough, because of how hard it is to get into a <laughs> I, was, I was about to ask you, was the second time intentional? No, it was not. But, you know, it was a it was a fun ride. I enjoyed a hell out of it. I'm, I would say this movie is worthy enough of carrying, uh, not carrying the Jurassic Park name, because technically it doesn't, but it's worthy enough of being a part of the Jurassic Park franchise. So I would gladly give it a 4 out of 5. So that was those were our extended thoughts on Jurassic World. We hope you've enjoyed it. I've been Kaiju Noir and Pete. And until next time, everybody, take care. <laughs>